Welcome. My name is Susan Grew, and I am the Director of Programs for the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation. And I want to welcome you to our wonderful medical lecture series, Medicine in Our Backyard. This series is presented by us, and it is sponsored by UC Irvine Health, and we would like to thank them for their sponsorship and their partnership with us, the foundation, in bringing their doctors here to the Newport Beach Public Library. This lecture series concludes on May 22nd with Dr. Claudia Kawas, and we invite you all to attend this last lecture. There are brochures uh, with complete details on Dr. Kawas and her subject matter in the back of the room. And a quick bit about us. The Library Foundation is a membership-driven organization. Our mission is to support this library and to bring stimulating programs to the community. If you are not already a member of our foundation, I invite you to join tonight. We have membership applications as well as information about all of our upcoming programs in the back. And for those of you that are members, and I see quite a few of you out here tonight, we thank you for your support and your help in continuing to bring quality programming like tonight's lecture here to the library. A few reminders, I, and I heard a couple of people talking about this in the back, they were concerned they didn't have a pen and paper to take notes. All of the entire lecture, including the doctor's presentations, will be available for video streaming and downloading to your computer to watch through our website. Uh, usually it takes a week or less, so keep checking our website, that's nbplfoundation.org, and um, all of this information will be available for you to look over again and again. Also, gentle reminder to silence your cell phones. And finally, I know you're all here and you all have questions and want to know so much about um, the doctor's lectures and, and what they're going to be presenting tonight. We ask that you please hold all your questions until the end of both of the doctor's lectures. We, allow, we built in plenty of time for a Q&A session uh, after the doctor's lectures and that is the time to ask the questions. Thank you. Now, for those of you who don't know Mike and Polly Smith, I want to introduce them to you. They are staunch supporters of both the Library Foundation and UC Irvine Health. And it is through their vision and leadership that this series, Medicine in Our Backyard, has become a reality. We thank them so much. And Mike is a native of Newport Beach. He was born here and raised um, on the island. And Polly arrived here as soon as she could in 1954. Uh, she came in search of a lively time and was looking for someone who owned a sailboat. <laughs> well, she met Mike at the Jolly Roger on Balboa Island. And Mike, I don't know if I know, did you own a sailboat? <laughs> anyway, and the rest is history. They've lived here in Corona del Mar for over 25 years after long careers in the electronics industry. And we are so glad to be able to call them our neighbors and our supporters. So, without further ado, Mike Smith. Well, it's a nice full house. That's the good news, and the bad news is I hope you're not all uh, sufferers with Parkinson's or other movement disorders. Um, but thank you for coming, and all of you people from Regents Point, who I think you've been sucked into this uh, for the first time for most of you, and we hope you enjoy it. Um, how many of you here either yourselves or have family members with uh, one of the neurological diseases that we're going to talk about. Yeah, I'm sorry to see that many hands, but on the other hand, uh, well, it's not really a pun, is it? Uh, I'm glad you're here, and, and I know you'll get a lot out of this. Uh, personally, my situation was my father had Parkinson's. My mother had um, a cancer of the brain. So I'm really interested in, in what they have to say and uh, the things that maybe are new from the period when my parents uh, both suffered. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Nicholas Philippe. He's a specialist in Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. He received his MD from Buenos Aires University, 
um, and he also did uh, uh, specialized in internal medicine. He followed with fellowships in neurology, uh, both in Brazil and at the University of Toronto. Um, he came here in uh, 2013 and uh, is an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at UCI. So please welcome Dr. Philip, and uh, we'll get going here. Hello, how are you all? Uh, just a minor clarification. Although Brazil is much more appealing than Argentina, uh, I'm from Argentina, which is a, a little bit south. Uh, so I'm from Patagonia. We have nice uh, glacier lakes, mountains. Uh, you can enjoy, if you go, good food, not so warm as Brazil. Uh, we have a little bit uh, more, uh, we are more dressed than in Brazil as well. So <laughs> I'll, I'll move on with the, with the presentation now. My, my topic, what I was requested to, to ask about that I think is very interesting or important for, for uh, patients and families, uh, have to do what we may discuss, uh, we name as early indicators of Parkinson's disease. And that's what I'm going to talk about. I, I don't have any financial uh, disclosure so far. I wish I had, but, but not yet. Um, so I'm going to talk about some historical and, and present perspective on how we diagnose this disorder. How are we uh, convinced you, you might be suffering that? Uh, I'm going to quote one, I think, interesting examples on, on, on wh how or, or what are we trying to do to find the initial symptoms of these problems. And finally, I'm going to summarize uh, most of that research in, in just uh, hopefully uh, not, not so very uh, burdensome slides or bothersome slides. So I'll try to go uh, quick. Um, 200 years since uh, James Parkinson's described this uh, disorder, there are many other authors that, that describe similar conditions before him, but we credited him for, for acknowledging uh, better or characterize it better. And some of the things he did describe in those initial six patients, again, 200 years ago, still apply today. He said, well, uh, there is some involuntary tremors motion with lessened muscular power in parts not in action, so when you are resting, and even when supported with the propensity to bend the trunk forward to pass from a walking to a running pace. The sens senses and intellect being uninjured, at least in those six patients that he saw. Um, so we, we do apply that still to diagnose the condition. Uh, one of the cardinal uh, findings is that you have difficulty moving, and we call that bradykinesia. It entails uh, slowness of movement, so you move slow, uh, reduce amplitude of movement, and also some difficulties keeping the rhythm when you do some sort of rhythmic movement. Rigidity is some sort of resistance to passive examination of the muscle tone, and what he mentioned as resting tremor. So when you're resting, you might shake at a specific frequency of around three to five times in a second, so three to five hertz, with some postural imbalance. We still use uh, different combinations of that to diagnose the disorder. Uh, and of course, uh, Dr. Hermanovitz with very extensive experience and, and me with less experience, but you do need experience to see what, what I'm mentioning there in a, in a human being. Um, another thing James Par Parkinson mentioned was the diseases of long duration. To connect, therefore, symptoms that occur in its later stages with those which marks its commencement requires a continuance of observation of the same case or at least a correct history of its symptoms, even for several years. And that is our challenge. What happens before the patient comes to our office? How early can we know about that? All right. If we know about that, we would be understanding what happens before motor symptoms are present, before the patient comes to our office. And we might even screen that, maybe some blood work, and maybe the primary care practitioner can realize, well, these symptoms are what we might call a prodromal or early Parkinson's disease. Uh, in this timeline, this is 20 years before diagnosis, 10 years before diagnosis, and you see here at zero time is usually when diagnosis is given to the patient, 
and the patient is maybe hopefully in our office or, or in a, the office of someone that understands about Parkinson's disease. Um, so this is what I'm going to talk about, what happens before uh, we give this diagnosis and, and why is this important? Well, because maybe we can start treatment uh, early on when the disease has not advanced yet. Um, one important effort uh, trying to understand or answer this question uh, was published in 2014 by uh, Dr. Schrag from uh, London. Um, she compared uh, cases of Parkinson's disease with other patients and, and she did a chart review together with other doctors and tried to find which symptoms were more prevalent or more frequent in Parkinson's disease versus healthy controls. Uh, and so here you have a list of all these symptoms, uh, twice constipation, I think was a type of so rest, resting tremor is the second one, fatigue, dizziness, depression, shoulder pain or stiffness, anxiety, neck pain or stiffness, urinary dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, sleep problems, insomnia, balance, hypotension, memory difficulties, and this uh, rigidity. And she could, under, she could study charts from patients, 7,000 7, patients roughly with Parkinson's disease, two to zero years before diagnosis versus 4,000 patients with other conditions without Parkinson's disease. Five to two years before diagnosis, this number is a little bit less, you know, 4,000, almost 5,000 patients with Parkinson's versus 25 patients with, without Parkinson's. And 10 to five years before diagnosis, she had charts from almost 2,000 patients with Parkinson's disease versus 8,000 uh, patients without Parkinson's disease. And, and these were her, her findings. Um, so she's comparing these symptoms, so tremor, constipation, fatigue, dizziness, depression, shoulder pain, and sti or stiffness, and anxiety. This list is a uh, order according to the, the frequency of the symptoms two years before diagnosis. So the most frequent one was tremor 40, that was present in 41% of patients with Parkinson's disease versus just in 1% of the healthy controls. And not the healthy controls, sorry, patients with other diseases, similar sex and similar age. But you see, uh, 10 to five years before this diagnosis, the difference is not so striking. Just 2% of patients with Parkinson's disease had tremor, and just 1% of patients without Parkinson's disease have a tremor. So if she, she kept comparing symptoms, and she found, so for example, there was some difference in constipation here. 10 years, uh, sorry, I cannot see the mouse. Just give me one second. I want to show you what I'm talking about. Um, Okay, here it is. So constipation, 20% of patients with Parkinson's had constipation versus 15% of patients without Parkinson's disease. So on and so forth, you can, you can compare these symptoms, right? Fatigue, 11% versus 7%, dizziness, 12 versus 9, depression, 10 versus 4, shoulder pain or stiffness, same, 10% to 10%, anxiety, eight versus six. Um, so there is a challenge there, right? How specific are the symptoms? How can they help us to answer the question? Same with other, uh, other symptoms, right? Uh, that, I, that I've mentioned before. Um, so here is the challenge when we try to answer this question. So before motor symptoms are present, how many good studies are, trying, are answering what are the specific symptoms that, that would lead to motor Parkinson's disease? How specific they are? How early are they present? 10 years before we diagnose Parkinson's disease? And, and even more so in the modern world, how expensive would be to screen big numbers of, of population to see, well, just of 1,000 patients, one might have Parkinson's disease and we spent maybe $1 million trying to answer that question. That, that's a lot of money, although we are trying to help one human being. It would be ideal to spend less and help many more. Um, so uh, summarizing what, what many studies, uh, like the previous study, have found so far, I'm going to show you this uh, very uh, briefly. 
Uh, here you see the first symptom is called uh, RVD or REM sleep behavior disorder in which people that are deeply asleep uh, cannot relax their muscles. So if they dream they are fighting, they indeed fight in bed and can hit the partner and injure the partner. I, I hear some laughter. Uh, sometimes we hear some crying. So it's, it, it can be bad, can be sometimes be really bad. So the level of evidence showing that REM sleep behavior disorder can precede Parkinson's disease is high. What does high mean? Well, at least there are four good design trials or research studies showing that this is the case. Uh, this increases the risk for people to, suffer, to be diagnosed in the future with Parkinson's disease by around uh, 50 uh, compared to other uh, human beings. This can be present around 13 years before people are diagnosed uh, with this disorder. And the cost here would be either low if we ask a question, but just asking a question is very inspecific, or high if we do a very specific study called uh, polysomnography, and that is much more expensive and it's hard to screen lots of people with that study. How, how, am, I, how am I with, with time? Ten minutes more, so half, half of the talk already. Okay. Um, subtle motor deficits is also important, so this bradykinesia I was talking to you about, there is a score we, we do uh, get from patients when we examine them, so a score of three or more in a scale called Unified Parkinson's Disease Resting Scale conveys some uh, higher risk to suffer, to have the full syndrome, uh, a few years later, like five years later, okay, so the relative risk if you have mild uh, motor deficit is 10 times more than other uh, human beings. And moderate to high the cost depending on where you do it, if a doctor is examining you uh, or not. And, and you have other, uh, other symptoms that we ask for or that we are more aware that they might uh, precede Parkinson's disease, like olfactory loss, constipation, depression and anxiety, uh, something that, that it uh, comes up very frequently in talks is how, how about a scan, the, the functional imaging in the brain. If I do it and it's positive or negative, will, will that uh, give me the risk that I'm going to have more Parkinson's disease or more chances that I will develop it? Uh, how much evidence is there for that study? Well, the evidence is not huge. Uh, there are, uh, are two studies showing that it, it might, if you have a positive scan, you might develop the motor symptoms around five years later. Uh, there is a relative risk that, that you might have it more than other people, like by 20 times more. But it's very high uh, uh, cost. Uh, it's $13,000 for that, that test in the USA. Um, and well, for my people, some people might not be a lot, but for most people, it, it is expensive, an expensive study. Uh, same with, with novel uh, research over the last uh, five years, we've been trying to see if uh, alpha-synuclein, that is the protein that is present in the brain, uh, might, uh, might be present in the gut before it's present in the brain. Um, so the level of evidence that alpha-synuclein in the colon, for example, might, might convey more risk of people developing later on a brain disorder is low. There are not so many studies. Uh, the relative risk that that uh, colon biopsy can convey a human being is uncertain, and we don't know how, how early uh, before you have the disorder you might have alpha-synuclein in your in your gut, in your colon. Uh, you see two red, red things here in the table. So constipation and this thing I'm talking about, this protein in, in your colon. Uh, this is a very interesting subject, trying to answer about prodromal Parkinson's disease. Many of you might be aware that the relationship between the enteric nervous system or the gut uh, neurons uh, and the brain is being acknowledged more and more not just for Parkinson's disease, but for other disorders. And there is some hypothesis that maybe constipation is not only a prodromal symptom, but maybe can convey some predisposition for people to get Parkinson's disease. Um, so those are all the, all the symptoms uh, that uh, researchers are working about. 
I think it is a complex matter still. I think the words of James Parkinson still hold. It's very hard to know what's happening before a motor uh, impairment. Um, so when you pull out uh, all, all this uh, data together, um, the Movement Disorder Society, Parkinson's and the Movement Disorder Society, build up what they called a research diagnostic criteria for early or prodromal, not early, but prodromal, before motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And they try to, to uh, weight how much uh, likelihood of developing Parkinson's disease you might have if you suffer this, uh, this, if you have these findings or these symptoms. So for example, RVD or REM sleep behavior disorder with a polysomnography, the expensive study, can convey a more likelihood that you have Parkinson's disease. Scans uh, like PET scan or SPEC scan can also convey high uh, likelihood ratio. And, and they, did, they did put all these chances of people from suffering the disorder versus the chances of not suffering it when you don't have any of these uh, findings. And with that, uh, they build another uh, score. So if you multiply all those uh, markers or symptoms together, and if you are 50 to 54 years old, and the number is around 1,000, multipl multiplying all these symptoms, you have the chances of 80% of developing at some point of time uh, Parkinson's disease. And as you see, as people age, so more than 79 years old, in the bottom of the table, uh, the score should be much smaller, so there are much more chances to have Parkinson's disease with less of these markers. Why? Well, because the disease is more prevalent with an aging population or with people age. So I think I'm almost uh, finished for the 20 minutes. There's a work in progress here, as you can see, this is complex. Uh, we need much more research to definitely answer the questions. And at UCI, we are uh, indeed doing some of this research. For example, we're trying to find this if a blood test, some uh, blood examination, can discriminate between healthy individuals and, and Parkinson's disease. And, and we do need uh, uh, all, all your participation in these studies. It's, it's very important for us. So thank you very much. I wonder where my brain was. Uh, I, 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 should, I should know better. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Neil Hermanowitz, and he's Vice Chair of Neurology at UCI and Director of the UCI Movements um, Disorder Center. Um, he received his MD from Temple University Medical School and did his residency at the University of Wisconsin and followed that with a fellowship in neurology at the University of Michigan. And Dr. Hermanowitz joined us at UCI in uh, 1999. Dr. Hermanowitz. Great to be here, nice to see some familiar faces in the audience. Uh, thank you for the uh, invitation to speak. So I'm gonna be talking about some you know, newer therapies and things that are in the works, new, new treatments that are under development for Parkinson's disease, which is still, although James Parkinson 200 years ago first described this, this illness, it's still an area of excitement in the basic science research and also in development of uh, new therapies, which I'm gonna to touch on in just a little bit. I'm older than Nicholas, so I do have some disclosures, people that I've done consulting work with in the past, people I've done clinical trials with in the past, or, or people that I've worked with for educational purposes as well. Uh, this is our movement disorders group. Uh, just briefly, it's uh, Nicholas and myself, a neurosurgeon, uh, Dr. Sue Tim O'Brien, who's a neuropsychologist. And then if you come to see us in the clinic, you'll meet some of the people in the clinic, Terry Randall and Aisha and Erica as well. Um, this is a complex disorder, as you just heard about uh, from uh, Nicholas, and we'll talk uh, a bit more about that in the past. The deficiency of dopamine was identified in 1959. Dopamine is still the mainstay of therapy for the treatment of symptoms, the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. 
Uh, people ask me, leave it open. It's been around since 1975. Cinemet is another name for it. Is there nothing new? Yes, there are newer things. There are not yet better things for the treatment of symptoms of Parkinson's disease, but we've gotten so much smarter about how we use these medications, particularly in how we use uh, levodopa, Cinemet, and there are also novel ways of giving it to people that make it more efficacious and less likely to cause uh, side effects. So the replacement of dopamine in the brains of people with Parkinson's disease has really been the focus, the push. Uh, we can't give people dopamine because it won't get into the brain if people swallow it. We can't give it by an injection either. So it's given by mouth in the form of levodopa. The medication, actually a patient was saying to me today, actually it's the daughter, uh, her father is my patient and uh, I started him on levodopa some time ago and she said, you know, this, this medication is really astonishing. This really is almost a miracle in terms of how it can transform people from being poorly mobile to being more mobile, not completely erasing the symptoms, but improving mobility. And it was, this, was, this had a Lazarus type effect when this medication first came on the scene in the 60s. Maybe you saw that, that uh, movie with Robert De Niro some years ago, but it really did transform Parkinson's disease from being something that people regarded as a terminal illness to something that is a chronic illness that can be be dealt with, and actually the people involved with the development of levodopa for Parkinson's disease did uh, rightfully get the Nobel Prize some uh, years ago. The issue is that it doesn't last a long time. It's got a short duration effect, not meaning that it wears off, you can only use it for five years. That is not true. That's a myth that remains out in the public eye on the internet now, but it's not true. What I mean is that people take it, and initially, maybe six hours later, they'll take another pill, another six hours, they'll take another pill. But as time goes by, that interval tends to shorten, and that becomes a problem in people with Parkinson's. Instead of three times a day, it's four times a day, and then it's five or six times a day. And also, it causes what are called dyskinesias. That's a second bullet point. This is what you see still with Michael J. Fox, how he kind of moves around. That's not from Parkinson's disease, that's from treated Parkinson's disease, and that can be troubling to people who have been on the medication for a while. The other issue is that all these medications are delivered by the gut for almost all of them. And you heard from Nicholas uh, just a moment ago that the gut is an early problem in people with Parkinson's disease. It misbehaves, it slows down. The stomach can be slow to empty and the medications are not absorbed through the stomach, they're absorbed through the small intestine. So getting them to the lo location in the gut where they're absorbed can be a real challenge in some people. So there are newer forms of levodopa. You may have heard about Ritari, which is a new form of carbidopa levodopa. It came out about two years ago. And there's a new Ritari version two that is being worked on now. This is a medication that is levodopa that we've had since 1975, but it lasts longer. The, a company actually up in the Bay Area impacts has been working to try to develop a form that lasts longer. So instead of six times a day, people can take it three times a day, maybe even two times a day. There's another form from a company called Teva that's being worked on now, uh, also longer acting. So instead of taking it four to six times a day, maybe twice a day that people can take this and have a smoother delivery of this very effective medication during the course of the day. Uh, some solutions uh, for um, uh, the, treating the symptoms uh, with medications don't rely on the gut, which is a good thing. The gut is an unreliable organ of delivery of medication for people with Parkinson's disease. It is often a problem in terms of people take their pills, they don't work, or they have to wait a long time before it works. So there's a lot of um, unreliability in using the uh, gut as a delivery system. So there's a patch that's been around since, uh, I think, 2007 called rotigotine, or the new pro patch. Some of you may be using it. It goes right through the skin, into the blood, and then to the brain. It's bypassing the gut. There's an injectable form of medication that's been around forever called apomorphine. It is not morphine. Apo means not. It's not morphine. The other, the, the trade name is uh, Apokin, but people use this as a rescue medication. And I have a patient in the past, he was a large fellow, liked to go out to dinner, and at the end of uh, his, his meal in a restaurant, two hours later, he couldn't get out of his chair. He was a big man, and it would take all the waiters in the restaurant to hoist this guy out of his chair to get him uh, outside. But he used this medication, he would inject himself. It would work in about 10 minutes, he could get up and walk out of the restaurant, which he found 
very helpful. Uh, many of you have probably heard about deep brain stimulation. It's also been around for a while in the United States. There's something else called DUOPA, which is uh, an interesting, also invasive technique where a tube is inserted through the abdominal wall directly into the small bowel where the drug is absorbed. And then it's continually pumped in by a device. You can see it on the right side on the, on the screen. There's a pump with a cassette that continually pumps in levodopa during the course of the day, sometimes for an 18-hour uh, period or even longer for the full 24 hours. We have patients who've had this done. Nobody wants a tube in their gut with, a, with something hanging, you know, with a device outside. But for people having the short interval, taking medication every two hours during the course of the day and having these involuntary squirming movements, this can be extremely helpful. And instead of deep brain stimulation, which is a procedure of putting electrodes into the brain on both sides, they have a tube in the gut. For those who are good candidates, it can work very, very well. Uh, this is an example of what the device looks like uh, next to a woman who has that type of uh, therapy. It does require that the cartridge be changed daily. The, the tube has to be flushed daily. It sometimes gets blocked and has to be replaced, but this has been a very effective method for treating these motor fluctuations, this up and down, and these involuntary movements which are induced by levodopa. There's a company in Israel called Neuroderm. This is not on the market, it's under development. And instead of putting a tube in the gut, they put a needle under the skin and continually infuse carbidopa and levodopa just under the skin with attached to a little reservoir that you can see in the illustration. They are now trying for approval uh, in Europe and in the United States at the same time. This has been a very interesting story. About four years ago, they presented their data at the Fox Foundation meeting that I go to in New York uh, each fall, and it was one of the showstoppers, I have to say, uh, at that particular meeting. This, you know, it's like an insulin pump, the same sort of idea, and not a tube uh, so invasively into the gut. So we're all sort of waiting to see how this uh, fares in terms of their clinical trials. Uh, I mentioned the, uh, the large fellow who would inject him, himself in the, in the restaurant, but there are other ways to try to get that medication to people instead of an injection. Nobody likes a needle if it can be avoided. So an inhaled form of levodopa, using it like an asthma-type medication, using an inhaler, is under study right now. I anticipate this will be approved later this year, uh, perhaps next year by the FDA. There's also the, remember the apomorphine, not morphine, that's being developed, we're participating in this particular study. It's a strip uh, which people put underneath their tongue and it's absorbed through the, through the lining of the oral cavity, not swallowed. Can work quite quickly as well. A little bit of medical school, just for a moment or two here. Uh, this is a little bit about the pathology of Parkinson's disease. On the left-hand side, you see a section through the head like this. You see the eyes in the front and you see that sort of yellowish brown area, which is the brain stem, and that is the site of some of the major change in the brain in Parkinson's disease. And then you see the sections in the middle there showing the substantia nigra, that's Latin for dark substance. That's where the dopamine producing brain cells live and are, are, are found. And then you see in the bottom there, uh, a section through somebody with Parkinson's disease, you see that that dark substance is less apparent. You can see it with the naked eye. This is a drawing, but that's exactly how it looks like. If you were to take a section through, through that area right here and put it on a glass slide and stain it with some pink stuff called H&E stain, this is what you can see. This is a brain cell right here, and inside is this round pink thing that's the Lewy body. Now, you may have heard of Lewy bodies. If you have Parkinson's or your spouse does, you've heard of Lewy bodies. This is the pathological marker. This is the microscopic marker of Parkinson's disease. And it was said by several people in the past, if we understand Lewy bodies, we will understand Parkinson's disease. It turns out that the Lewy body is made to a great extent with a protein called synuclein. It is, it is accumulating abnormally. All proteins have a folding mechanism, and in Parkinson's disease, synuclein folds abnormally within the brain. 
it clumps together in ways that it should not. It is kind of like protein garbage within the cell that the cell is struggling to deal with. And the way the cell probably is trying to cope with this is to put it up all into a ball and push it off to the side. And that's what is a, a Lewy body. It's the, it's the cell's struggle to protect itself from the protein garbage, to push it off over here. But uh, as it's accumulating, these smaller fragments can be toxic to the cell. We think that these smaller fragments are what are killing the brain cells in Parkinson's disease. And if we could get them out some way, that may be a method for saving brain cells in people with Parkinson's disease. So how can we take them out? This is microscopic. How can we attack these? Of these little groups of protein before they become a Lewy body, before the cell is struggling to put it off to the side? Well, there are very various methods that people have used, pharma pharmaceutical companies have used, to very specifically attack things in the body that you want out or to remove. There are drugs on the market now. You hear about them on television for commercials. Humira. It's a monoclonal antibody. It's developed to specifically attack parts of the body that you don't want misbehaving. Avastin, you probably don't hear about so much. Desabri is used for MS. Uh, Rituxan is used for a form of lymphoma. So this concept is out there. It's been out there for quite some time. People are also using the same concept, developing an immune response, and a monoclonal antibody to attack those little clumps of synuclein. So a company in Vienna, Austria called Afris has been working on a vaccine to trigger the immune response against those little clumps of synuclein. One of my patients moved to Vienna to participate in that clinical trial, which is still ongoing. His wife is from Vienna, so they had a connection there. But they, that trial is still ongoing. It showed some positive response when they gave the vaccine. The body did respond to attack synuclein, and about half of the patients who, who got the vaccine showed some response. So there's, that trial is still going underway. This is not to treat the symptoms. This is to attack the disease itself. Um, another company called Prothena, which is just up the road in San Francisco, is partnering with Roche, which is a big pharmaceutical company in Switzerland, to develop monoclonal antibodies just like Humira, which is already on the market for rheumatoid arthritis and ulcerative colitis, to attack the uh, synuclein little clumps to clear it out. That study is, is underway. They had some positive results, which they released earlier this month, April 2nd, so this is hot off the press. Uh, just uh, approximately 30 days ago, they had a press release showing that it was well tolerated, it seemed to be safe, it seemed to be doing the job they expected it to do. So they're moving on for, uh, toward, right now, clinical trials, uh, phase two, the initial study was a phase one, so they're starting phase two, which is mostly safety, but also looking at does this work in, in attacking Parkinson's disease. So this I find very interesting, and I think good news. I don't know if it's going to work or not. Nobody does yet, but so far, so good. I just want to point out that you know, I'm from UCI. There are UCI scientists doing similar things. The way things get developed for, for new therapies for diseases is that scientists at universities have ideas. Well, this looks good. This looks promising. And then they ultimately partner with a pharmaceutical company to bring it to market, to get it FDA approved and so forth. And Milton Greenberg and Charles Grabe, at, both at UCI, have received substantial grants from the Fox Foundation to work on these kinds of immune modulating therapies. There are other people at UCI, Michael Callahan, who's been there for quite some time, my, uh, Kim Green, Andrea Tenner, and Mike Dimitri, all work on modulating the immune system to address neurological disorders. So we have a big uh, uh, effort underway at the university to address these kinds of things. Another way to try to address uh, neurological symptoms is to use old medications for new purposes, and you've heard about this too. Finasteride is proscar for the prostate. It's also propecia to grow hair. Minoxidil was originally developed as a blood pressure medication. It also grows hair. Nobody's heard of sildenafil unless you get a prescription for Viagra, but that medication was initially developed for angina, 
but they found there was an interesting side effect in some men who were taking this <laughs> for a study and it became Viagra. It's also used for something called pulmonary hypertension, including in children. So there, there is a method of using drugs that are already on the market for new purposes, and we are doing that now at UCI. We are using an old medication, which I don't think I want to get into. Uh, well, it's not that, that's, that's, a, that's a, a precursor, but we're using an old medication, and we had our first patient, it's for Huntington's disease, but we plan on later this year also looking at it for Parkinson's disease. So that's underway at UCI, an old medication that's, the safety has been well established with that drug. We're looking at Huntington's disease and soon for Parkinson's disease. Oh, for everybody who recognizes this, could you raise your hand? We're going to be taking names. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so the, every day in the clinic, I get questions. What about medical marijuana? And, and the answer is we just don't know yet. It, 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 there, it, we think that cannabinoids might have some role. Cannabinoids are the active ingredients of, of marijuana. We think they might have some role in treating a wide variety of neurological disorders, but the work hasn't been done yet. There are animal models that look very interesting. I published some of those papers in the past looking at cannabinoids and how they might have an impact in animal models of Parkinson's disease. But the, the research is not yet there to recommend it as a therapy. My patients ask me, well, what if I take you know, those brownies or whatever, however they want to use it? I don't object to that, but it's, it's somebody doing their own experiment on themselves and then reporting back. I'm curious to hear what the experiences have been of uh, people. Uh, this is a complex uh, disorder that causes all sorts of problems. It's not just tremor and stiffness and slowness. It causes gut uh, malfunction, bladder uh, problems, impaired sense of smell, skin lesions, skin problems, skin rashes, malignant melanoma is more common in people with Parkinson's disease for reasons that are not really uh, entirely clear. Uh, there are other chemicals in the body that are used in treatment of Parkinson's disease. Uh, Pimavanserin is a medication that has an action at serotonin. This drug, which is called Nuplazid, is to use speci specifically to treat uh, symptoms of hallucinations that people in Parkinson's disease may get. Uh, seeing people in their home who are not actually there, it occurs more commonly than you might think. Uh, there are other brain chemicals that are being modified, uh, including, uh, again, the cannabinoids at the bottom of the slide. Uh, Nicholas mentioned the, the gut and Parkinson's disease. This, this is the brave new world of Parkinson's disease. I, I don't have a crystal ball, but this is hugely interesting. The story is not new. We've been talking about this for quite some time. This is a publication that was multiple sites, uh, mostly out of Caltech, but there are multiple other collaborators around the world uh, looking at, how, this is a mouse model, this is not people with Parkinson's disease, but looking how the gut influences uh, the, the motor manifestations as well as the inflammatory uh, changes in the brain of people with Parkinson's disease. Uh, this is a very intriguing topic. It has not really been addressed yet as a therapeutic intervention. I think that's coming. Uh, we have an interest, uh, I have an interest at UCI in screening people uh, who come to the GI clinic with GI symptoms of nonspecific source, something called gastroparesis, where they get bloating uh, or constipation, and they don't have diabetes, they don't have other explanations for why they are having these kinds of symptoms. I have an interest, we have an interest, and I hope this project gets started later this year, of carefully you know, screening people who are showing up in the GI clinic for unexplained GI symptoms, do they have impaired sense of smell? Do they have this funny dream behavior where they act out their dreams? Are there other indicators that they may be uh, early indicators of Parkinson's disease? So that's one of our projects that I hope will be launched uh, later this year. Uh, that's the end of my slides. I'm gonna just show you a movie for a moment. These are my, this is my wife and two children uh, on the uh, west coast of Iceland, my wife's home country. I just like this movie, so I thought I would show it to you too. <laughs> this is, a, this is a, a nice day in June in Iceland. <laughs> and I think it comes to an end there, but uh, that's, that's the end of my slides. So now we can take some questions or comments. And thank you both, and I'm going to invite both Drs. Philippe and Dr. Hermanowitz up again to take your questions, and we do have a nice amount of time, and I see some hands for both doctors. Yes, sir. Yes, 
So the, the question is about Sweden and stem cells. So yes, that is a huge interest in a variety of ways. It would be another talk to, to, to address stem cells in neurological diseases, including Parkinson's disease. I know there are places that are trying to get things underway in human trials. I haven't heard of any outcomes yet, either in Sweden or in England, where they've also had some activity, or in Australia, where there has been some initial activity. We're all interested in stem cells as a way to replace brain cells, ultimately, that have been damaged by Parkinson's disease, or as a way to alter the brain environment in a way that's protective for Parkinson's disease. Huge interest. Not, not quite there yet. In the back. Not at this time, but that, that, ha, that, is, that is being worked on. The oh, I'm sorry, the question, yeah, my apologies. So is, is there something now that we can do if somebody, if we have a high degree of suspicion, somebody's developing Parkinson's disease, can we do something now to stop it or to intervene? There have been clues along the way, but nothing conclusively. We've looked at a number of things, CoQ10, you may be aware of. We did that study, and we participated in that study at UCI, and unfortunately, it didn't work. Creatine has also been looked at. Uh, there have been some medications, prescription medications, that have been looked at that looked initially promising, but have not been conclusively demonstrating that it intervenes in the disease process. But that work is still going on, and eventually, we will do it. And if we don't have a way of finding these people early, that's not going to be helpful. So we have to do both of these things at the same time. We have to be looking for early indications of Parkinson's disease and working on ways to stop it when we find it. And I'm quite confident that the way the cure for Parkinson's disease, like so many things, is early detection and intervention then. Just that we do mammography or colonoscopy, early detection, and then nipping in the bud early. And we'll figure it out. Yes, sir, in the blue shirt. You want to answer? Yeah, yeah, sure. So the question was uh, regarding deep brain stimulation and walking problems. Um, it, it's an important question, and de depending on how you ask the question, you might have a different answer. If the main problem is you, you have advanced Parkinson's disease with motor fluctuations, and you are not responding well to levodopa, carbidopa, which is the classic med indication or medication for Parkinson's disease, and your main difficulty is gait or freezing of gait or even speech problems, what we call axial symptoms, deep brain stimulation is not a good option. However, uh, if you are suffering from dyskinesias, motor fluctuations, you are responding well to levodopa, carbidopa, and the wearing off of the medication is causing, amongst others, gait problems, maybe deep brain stimulation will take care of some of those fluctuations, helping you to walk. Uh, so deep brain stimulation is a, is a big question, and it's not for everyone. And uh, You might have benefit if you are responding well to levodopa, and it's wearing off quickly, or you're having lots of these kinesias or, or fluctuations. Over here. So uh, the question you ask, and I'll repeat it, is a, is a very good one. Uh, there are, there are, how do we know that it's Parkinson's disease versus something else? And that can be hard. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, and it, it, it is, even for people who've been doing it, I see a lot of people every day who have Parkinson's disease or Parkinson's-like disorders. But it's, it, it, it can be difficult to know. Uh, so it really relies on, on talking to the patient, inquiring about symptoms, doing an examination. Sometimes testing is helpful, but not always. And the test can be wrong too. So in the, in the situation where I'm not sure, I think about what test could be helpful. 
and and if they're not, then I I say, well, let's let's think about it longer, and on, you know, which is not very gratifying for anybody, including me. But I l let's meet again in four months and look at it again and see if there's any other indication of something happening. So uh, sarcopenia to me is, me is 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 indicating muscle wasting or weakness. Um, but I, there are a number of things that could cause uh, muscle wasting and weakness as well. And really, you don't want to, as a neurologist, I don't, you want, don't want to get hung up on just one thing on the examination. You really have to put the whole picture together with the symptoms and the clinical examination and maybe some testing too. When, when one, there's the idea that's out there that if you take levodopa and you respond, then it must be Parkinson's disease, and if you take it and you don't respond, then it's not. But that's not quite true. Uh, it also depends on how do you measure the response to levodopa. So I've had patients many times tell me that I, I took that medication, or their spouses too, they took the medication and it didn't really work. But I, when I examine, when we examine people, we do a methodical exam and record a score of a, of a rating scale that's used worldwide. So I know, oh, the score last time was 25, and today it's 13. It's so much better, but they're saying they're, they're not improved. But they, what they mean is that their tremor is no better. But other things can improve. So one has to be very careful about judging that. Yes, sir, here, with the, with the bolo tie. I like that bolo tie. Right. I, I think you were asking about MRI-guided ultrasound treatment, which is, uh, uh, yes, it is available in the United States. We, we've talked to the company. We, we, they were, we were interested in participating in their studies. Uh, they wanted $800,000 for the... <laughs> And we thought, well, get back to us later. Um, so uh, uh, the only place that I know of in California that has that device is Stanford. They do have it. And one of my patients, maybe he's here, uh, went up there recently, and he said there's a, they came back and told me there's a year-long wait to have that done. Plus, it's not approved specifically for Parkinson's by the FDA. So it is an interesting technique, very similar to things that we've done in the past. It, it, what is novel is that there's no hole drilled. It's a high energy beam of, of ultrasound focused into the brain to cause a little scar to form. In fact, uh, I, I don't know Michael J. Fox, but he had something similar to that done years ago. He had a thalamotomy by drilling a hole in the right side of the skull, putting an electrode in, cooling down the tip so it caused a scar, and then taking the electrode out. And that is fundamentally what this MRI guided ultrasound does, except there's no hole, no electrode. Yes, here, sir. Uh, would your recommendation for treatment be different if the patient not only had Parkinson's but also had rheumatoid arthritis? Um, I, you know, I would weigh that. I would, I would take that into consideration and make sure that there, I, you know, I don't think there would be, so the question is, would my treatment be different if, there were, if the patient also had rheumatoid arthritis and Parkinson's disease? I, I, I would take that into consideration, but I would use the same tools. Interesting thing, because there was a study done years ago. Uh, the question was, do, do, do people with, uh, you know, is Parkinson's disease in some form an autoimmune disorder? Because rheumatoid is. Uh, so there was a study done looking to see if there were increased numbers of people with rheumatoid arthritis who also had Parkinson's disease. Was it more likely? They found it less likely. Uh, and the reason for that was not clear. Uh, but the speculation was that people take, you, you, with rheumatoid arthritis, we're using immunosuppressing medications, immunomodulating medications like Humira, and maybe that was making it less likely to get Parkinson's disease. On a similar note, there was a study recently published by the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, looking at the frequency of Parkinson's disease in Olmsted County, which is where the Mayo Clinic is, and they reported that there seemed to be an increase and they speculated, they didn't know for sure, but they speculated that might be due to reduced cigarette smoking. Because we've known for a long time that people who smoke 
are less likely to get Parkinson's disease. Not because they die. There is, there is something there. And people who drink coffee are less likely to get Parkinson's disease. So I should probably go in the back of the room. The, the, yes, miss, in the, in, ma'am, in the, in the red. Further back, and then we'll come back. Some sort of poison episode? So the question is, are, could exposures be associated with people getting Parkinson's disease? Oh, yes. People have noticed that and published that. It's been studied. But the, the link is not real clear. Um, you know, for example, my friend colleagues at, at UCLA, they went up to the Central Valley, and they still are, in, in uh, California, and they do find that there is seemingly an increased risk of getting Parkinson's disease for people who are working in agriculture in the Central Valley compared to people who are not. Uh, that's not a novel finding. It was, it was known uh, years ago that people who were growing up in Canada drinking well water before the age of 18 were more likely to get Parkinson's disease, or people in rural communities in China, same thing. So there, there does seem to be some risk with exposure, not invariably, and it's a very difficult study to do. It's so complicated to do these kinds of studies. You have to look at large numbers of people over long periods of time, but it's, it, it is... There does seem to be a factor of environmental exposures in some people, but it's not clear what that is. Maybe it's herbicides or pesticides. But then, but then you relate that to oxidative stress. If you look at like oxidative stress and Parkinson's So you're talking about oxidative stress, which has also been recognized as a potential component in, in the injury of brain cells. And yes, and that's been replicated by use of things like rotenone, which people put on their roses or use in ponds to kill fish that they don't want. So that's been replicated in the laboratory. But exactly that, that step from living on a farm in Canada to and drinking well water to Parkinson's disease, that link has not yet been firmly established. Well, what are those things? And why doesn't everybody who grows up on a farm, I grew up in Illinois, I didn't live on a farm, uh, Normal Illinois, it sounds like a farm, farm town. Uh, but but it, yeah, not everybody who grows up, actually it's the minority of people who grow up in those environments uh, get Parkinson's disease. So there's something, you know, people speculate, well, yeah, there's some genetic susceptibility uh, along with the environmental exposure. And it's, an on, you know, it's huge, of huge interest still. But the answer is, is not yet identified. Um, it's been, I, I am not, uh, I don't know of a colleague at, at UCI who is doing that right now, but yes, it's, it's, it remains a research interest in other, other laboratories. Yes, over, wh oh yes, yes, yeah, you're next. Nicholas. I said we wish there was, and we are trying to find it. So we, we are doing that research. Uh, there is pre preliminary data on a few patients that there might be some findings in blood separating those healthy patients versus Parkinson's disease patient. as you, patients. As you must imagine, these are already diagnosed patients. So the next, next question will be how early those blood changes will be present in people, right? So it's a very complex combination of lipids, not typical lipids, very initially very uh, brain, brain lipids, yeah. What are lipids? Oh, lipids are fat, uh, fat in, the, in blood, right? So, so free, free fatty acids, cholesterol, triglycerides, so, so that is the substance of myelin or neurons. I don't know if you've ever eaten uh, some ravioli with brain or something like that, it's very fatty. So that's, that's what they are testing. You're welcome. One question before you keep. So there was a question about stem cells, and I just wanted to mention uh, two things. 
There is stem cell uh, research published in Parkinson's disease and is relevant to the early manifestation of the disease. These two research uh, published in uh, from US researchers found that stem cell treatments was not effective in patients with Parkinson's disease. In fact, findings were that the outcome was poorer, they did worse. And we speculate that we failed to find improvement because we tested patients too late in the disease process. So as early as possible would be relevant. And be wary, be aware and careful that there are many clinics in Orange County and outside of Orange County offering you uh, to get your money to put stem cells in your brain. Uh, we would not recommend that now. Yes, yes ma'am. So the question is, why does it take too, so long for neurologists to reach a diagnosis? <clears throat> um, some things take long. Some, sometimes it's, it's not so long. Uh, it depends on the, the symptoms. And, and it, as I was mentioning earlier, that it, sometimes it just isn't clear. And when, when I, I've said that you know, tough cases are tough for everybody. So if it's tough for your neurologist, it would be tough for me, I, I think. I, so it, it, it just is not clear. And, and talking about Parkinson's disease, it was published in the past that people with Parkinson's disease, on average, visit doctors for two years or a little bit longer with, with complaints. I'm not feeling well, I'm, my walking has changed or something, and it just isn't clear uh, uh, to many people who see these patients. They see their primary care doctor and go, well, you're, you know, you're, it's this or it's that. Or, you know, you know. It, it just, if, if it were easy, they'd, they they get it. It's just that the body is so complicated. Uh, yeah. I think is what. Well, some things you can say off the bat. So I I, I do that. You know, people come to see me and they they've got a, a tremor. Or I had saw somebody today who was concerned that she might have Lou Gehrig's disease, and it was quite clear she does not. She has some things, but she does not have Lou Gehrig's disease. So that I could say definitively, not there. Uh, in the in the way, in the yes so, yes yes you <laughs> sorry yeah yep So the question is, are the, the, the symptoms of hallucinations or delusional thinking, are these in the late stages of Parkinson's disease? Not necessarily. Uh, it's thought that they are more likely to occur later in the course of Parkinson's disease, but I have patients who have relatively mild motor problems and not had Parkinson's disease for very long and have hallucinations. So not always, but more likely to occur later. And uh, are, are they indicators of, of bad things to come uh, or mortality, risk of death? Um, I don't know how to comment about that. I think I would address it on an individual basis and see how somebody is doing. If, uh, and it's, people ask me on a slightly different topic. People want to know, what does the future hold? How will I be in five years? How will I be in 10 or 15 years? I have a patient. I haven't seen him here this evening, but he's in his 80s and he wants to know how he will be in 20 years. <laughs> it's a val this guy is so active, you can't believe it. I mean, he's, he's, he, if, you know, he'd beat us all up if he were here the, this evening. He is, so, and I just don't know for any of my patients. I get it, I understand the question. It had, there are pragmatic issues about planning for the future as well as the need to know how is my life going to be? People with, with this diagnosis 
I think, think about it a lot. Uh, how am I going to be? Am I going to be a burden to my spouse, etc., to my family? That comes up. But I don't know, and there is no way to reliably predict how things are going to proceed. When I was younger, early in my career, and people forced me into a corner to, to make an estimate, not necessarily with Parkinson's disease, but something else, I remember giving a response and then oh, regretting it uh, almost instantly. And then when they, of course, were still around, much <laughs> I really, you know, I just, I just learned not to do that. Uh, yes, in the back, with your, yes, in the, Yep, 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 you. Um, oh. 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 So the question is about, this is not a Parkinson's question, this is something about cervical dystonia that I, I diagnosed. And again, I, I, perhaps, but it, probably this is not the, the setting to, we, we'd have to sit down and talk and you know, get greater detail about what's going on and, and get a clear, I'd have to get a clear idea. I, I hate to make a recommendation across the, across the room. It wouldn't be fair to you. And, and, and yes, miss, and the, it, with the, yes. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, yes. So cog cognitive impairment is, uh, th there, is there a link between cognitive impairment and Parkinson's disease? Yes, there is. Uh, I'm not saying it's across the board, everybody is going to develop dementia. That's not the case. Dementia being impaired cognition to the point that in, in two areas, language and memory, for example, that interferes with daily functioning. But cognitive changes are pretty common to people with Parkinson's disease in the form of difficulty with multitasking, so-called executive functions, difficulty sometimes with attention, difficulty with visual spatial processing. These are subtle changes that can be present. If we look for them very carefully with formal neuropsychometric testing, we can find them fairly often in people with Parkinson's disease. But it's impossible really to predict when I see somebody, are they later going to be developing big problems with cognitive impairment or not. I, I, I can't predict that, but it, it does sometimes occur. I should add that it's uncommon that I see one of my patients who has severe cognitive impairment similar to Alzheimer's disease. It sometimes happens, but it's not the rule. It's not the, in general the case. So the question then is, are these medications that we use for the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease helpful for cognitive symptoms? And no, they are not. And in fact, a couple of the ones that you mentioned could make it worse. Uh, Artane, which is an anticholinergic medication, could make it worse. Amantadine could conceivably make it worse. So this really falls back to, to having a discussion with, with the physician or the, the the provider to make sure that you know, looking at all medications to make sure there aren't things that people could be taking like Benadryl, Tylenol PM, uh, that could be making cognition worse. Benadryl is a big offender. Uh, it's diphenhydramine. It's an anticholinergic medication, and it's a big offender for causing cognitive impairment. People think it's a benign medication for sleep. It, it is not necessarily. And we have time for two more questions, one for each doctor. Okay. Okay, so the question is, uh, how much risk do I have if my father or a sibling had Parkinson's disease? How much risk do I have to develop it? Well, maybe a little bit more than, than any other human being. 
but the chances are still very low. There are very infrequent but very special and specific forms of genetic Parkinson's disease that might convey a higher risk, uh, but that doesn't apply to almost most, most human beings, uh, probably also to you. Um, and you might also have some sort of a more precise answer when you know your family history. So if everyone in every generation had this very unusual disorder, so your, the chances are much higher. But this is, if this wasn't the case, uh, you might, your, your, con, your, your situation might, uh, might be as the same, same as in the other uh, human beings, so very low, low risk. Uh, one more? Okay, just you, yeah. Uh, no, I, I, we don't know. Uh, that's why I, we would, I, I have a, a research project where we'd like to look at exactly that question. Is gastroparesis, if, I assume your daughter's quite young. Uh, how, 27. So our project, my project, is to start looking at people 50 and above with gastroparesis of unexplained uh, source. So I, no, I wouldn't think so. And, you know, it's rare to encounter family members who, you know, my patients who say, oh, my father had Parkinson's or my mother had it. I, I see a lot of people with Parkinson's disease, and that's uncommon that people will tell me their parent had Parkinson's disease as well. So, shall we? Okay, we'll, we'll extend the, the question a little, a little bit. We should probably go way in the back. Yeah, yes, ma'am. So the question is, could chemotherapy have an impact on Parkinson's disease or, or causing Parkinson's disease? We're, we're not aware of it as a, being a cause for Parkinson's disease. And I've had several patients who've unfortunately had the bad luck to have both Parkinson's disease and a cancer and have gone through chemotherapy, a variety of cancers. And the stress of, of going through the treatment can temporarily increase the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. But it, we, as far as we know, it doesn't accelerate the course. Uh, and, and having said that, be aware that if you have stress for any reason, if you have stress because of another illness, a urinary tract infection could be something simple, or stress because you're, you're having some issues with your kids or with, with other things or finances, as we all do at some point, then, then that, that, those things too can increase the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. A, a, a sad example of that in my, from my practice was a man who, who I've, I've known for quite some time. He came in last year and he said, you know, my symptoms are worse, but I've been under recent stress. And sadly, his niece had been killed in a car accident. And it was quite evident on his examination. I mentioned that I record, we do this rating scale and I, I could, you know, I can look at his numbers. They were clearly worse than when I'd seen him uh, six months earlier. And it was because a week earlier he had gotten the news about his niece. When I saw him six months later, he was still grieving for his niece, but the acute shock of it had subsided and his, and his numbers improved. Yes, sir. What role does exercise play and what kinds of exercise would be beneficial for Parkinson's patients? So there, is, there are specific answers and general answers regarding uh, brain health. And, and exercise. So we do know from the oxidative stress hypothesis, made from animal models, and some uh, good, uh, good research done in human beings that exercise is good for you. Uh, how much, uh, what dose, we, we don't know exactly how much and what dose. We do know that whatever you can do might be helpful unless it harms you. So if you're not doing anything now and you suddenly say, well, I have to run a marathon, well, that's not advisable. And, and sometimes that is the attitude we have towards exercise. So now I want to do so much, but I don't have the time to do it. So whatever you find the time to do that will not hurt you, that you can do on a regular basis, that is much better than doing nothing. 
So being lean and not overweight, being physically active, and also this uh, Mediterranean diet uh, usually is showing more consistent results on better aging, uh, hopefully less dementia and better heart uh, health. Tango dancing, going back to Argentina, uh, has, uh, does have a lot of evidence on being helpful for Parkinson's disease. So dancing in general, you have a cortical cue, a rhythm that helps you, and you have a safety device that doesn't let you fall. <laughs> so that's, that's helpful. So, yeah. I, so along those lines, Nicholas, some, some years ago there was a study that was reported, it was only one, uh, indicating that, if, that you were less likely, I think, it was less likely to get Parkinson's disease if you ate a lot of beef. And that study came from Argentina. <laughs> were, you, were you involved with that study? Thank <laughs> you both doctors, this has been wonderful. And we do invite you to please come up and ask any questions that didn't get answered tonight. We do have the room for a few more minutes. Thank you.